Uh, hi, my name is Lee Vinsel. I'm an assistant professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. I'm also co-director of the Maintainers, a global research network interested in the concepts of maintenance, infrastructure repair, and the myriad forms of labor that sustain our human-built world. Today, I'm talking to Adam Tews, the Shelby Cullum Davis Chair of History at Columbia University and Director of the European Institute. In 2019, Foreign Policy Magazine named Professor Tews one of the top global thinkers of the decade. Professor Tews is the author of several books and numerous articles, and today we'll be talking about his work and the insights he brings to our COVID-19 moment. Adam, before 2018, people familiar with your work could easily think that you were a historian of economic thinking and economies between World War I and World War II. Um, and then in 2018, you published a history of the 2008 financial crisis, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. So what led you to write Crashed? Um, I mean, it was the immediate setting. I started doing it in 2013. I had relatively recently moved to the US. Um, at Yale at the time, I was sort of caught up in the backwash from Occupy in 2011. Several of my most brilliant graduate students had been very closely involved in that. So I was in a sort of superheated political, political economy environment, that I, the likes of which I hadn't been in since the 1980s, I think, in Britain. And, you mm -hmm. know, during the Thatcher period, I started college shortly after the end of the miners' strike. Um, there was a similar mood then, I think. So there was that stimulus. Um, I started thinking of it originally as a, an exercise. I was at the time very preoccupied with questions of philosophy of history, and I was extremely interested in the way in which people like Paul Krugman, um, uh, Reinhard Rogoff were in effect writing a kind of immediate history of the crisis as they went along. That had begun to occupy me almost immediately, 2008, 2009. It was clearly that Ben Bernanke was performing a kind of historical script, famously you know, trying to avoid the 30s deflation. So I got very interested in thinking about the notion of history they were employing. When I did that, I then suddenly, I realized that as it were to critique any particular construction of history, you actually probably needed the solid ground of your own narrative, um, because otherwise it just became a kind of rel highly you know, relativistic shuffling of well mm -hmm. under this kind of construction as opposed to another. And then when I started digging into that, I realized that all of the accounts that I was finding didn't really do justice to, well, two things. First of all, which then, you know, preoccupied me really very closely and go back to the very the beginnings of my work. Well, one, one was the, the most transparent was the transatlantic dimension. So they were accounts either of the Eurozone crisis or of the 2008 crisis viewed as an American disaster. And that clearly didn't do justice to the entangled nature of the crisis. So that took me to the terrain of the book Deluge on transatlantic relations after World War I, which I was just in the process of finishing and also the backdrop to Wages of Destruction, My History of Nazi Germany. And then as I dug in, something even more interesting, and this interests you probably from a kind of STS uh, kind of angle, it became clear that inside the sort of think tanks at the heart of global central banking and finance, places like the BIS, the basic categories of macroeconomics were being rethought in real time in response to the challenges of the crisis. In other words, the constructions of the national economy, which I had investigated in my first book on the history of economic statistics, were, which had been put together at the beginning of the 20th century, were, if not coming apart, then at least being dismantled, reassembled, reassessed um, in light of the banking crisis that, that was the real driver of 08. Uh, the, the, the key here is that the, 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 the anticipation of crisis in 06, 07, 08, especially amongst Democratic Party aligned wonks, exiles of the Clinton administration, had been classically macroeconomic. In other words, America had a current account deficit. It was therefore in hot to the Chinese. There would be a huge sell-off, a balance of payments crisis, rising interest rates. And none of that happened. Something else happened What right. that was, in fact, endogenous to, internal to what was assumed to be a depoliticized denationalized, globalized space of North Atlantic capital. Uh, but turned out, in fact, to be wholly reliant on the ability of the US Central Bank, the National Central Bank of the United States, to supply dollars to European banks, private banks. So 
at that point then it became very compelling for me to do this because even though it was a huge reach chronologically and I catapulted myself forward you know more than half a century on the other hand these questions of transatlantic politics the questions of the construction of the national economy and thinking about what a contemporary history would be these were really very close to my interest mm -hmm. so and no one else was doing it and at some point I realized no one else was going to write the 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 anniversary history and 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 then it then it you know became quite an urgent project and it did turn out that no one else really it's somewhat to my surprise yeah. i have to say no one actually else and we were you know we were very caught up with crisis the democracy books this was the early post-trump moment early early trump moment so there were a lot of reflections on history and political crisis but it didn't turn out that there were any major contributions on the political at least as you know as, of course people have been doing phenomenal work in lots of different venues but not as yeah. a big narrative history Mm -hmm. So we're about six months into the global pandemic and the response to it at this point, maybe more, depending on how you count it, um, and uh, as well as the economic fallout that it's created. Um, what features, I mean, you've been commenting in a number of venues as it's been going along, but now we're like six months in, what features of our moment you know, stick out to you uh, that may have been less apparent if you hadn't written Crashed? What have you been kind of tracking? Um, I mean, I'll get uh, uh, sort of three answers at different levels yeah. um, of generality. Um, you, you know, the, the most general question, obviously, is what is the status of the economic in determining and governing the, rel the scope of what it is possible to do politically in the, mo in the modern period? Mm -hmm. And that was a question that tracks me all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century with the construction of the economy as an object of politics as as the center of as it were growthmanship as, as so-called um as a constraint on you know the stabilization of the global economy after world war one the prioritization of growth of productivity of investment of this monetary stability as key priorities of politics <coughs> faced with a revolutionary threat at that point um and and uh, and COVID is, and, and then I moved on to start thinking a lot about the climate problem. And you, you'll right. remember, I mean, last as recently as last year, folks that said that we really had to take this seriously and therefore needed to stop flying and not sometime in the distant future when we thought of some way of substituting hydrogen powered planes or something. But now, immediately, we're dismissed as sort of, you know, an, uh, a death cult, literally, just, um, an extinction rebellion in the UK was widely criticized as a sort of apolitical, apocalyptic cult. And yet by, you know, early April, Heathrow Airport, JFK Airport were dead, empty. Yeah. Uh, so something that had been completely unimaginable suddenly became uh, just a matter of common sense. And that, that's profoundly shocking, I think, to my mm -hmm. common sense assumptions. And I think most people's common sense assumptions about how the world was wired, because hugely powerful, very, very powerful interests have lost a lot of money as a result of this. Now, you might say that the, the alternative would have been even worse, but it's not obvious that that's the case. And so on the counterfactual estimate that a lot of old people would probably die unless we shut things down, we shut things down, which is not how I assumed this system was wired. Uh -huh. um, and of course, it's been difficult to maintain. That's the bit I find easy to understand, that, you know, that, that the people have pressured to end the lockdowns that we're now trying to figure out other things. But the fact that we even then, we did it globally is, I think, really quite remarkable. So that's been a huge shock. Um, the second point at a lower level of abstraction is really, as it were, the relative coping capacities of different parts of the global system. Right. You know, uh, you know it's, a, it's a heuristic. <laughs> um, it's very inadequate, but as a sort of, as I often, you know, think about China, Europe, and the United States as a as a triptych. They are the three largest bits of the global economy. Um, and you know you see very striking things um, in that respect. And and of course, this is a way, if you like, of escaping the it's still in the end ends up dramatizing the american crisis but it's a way of escaping the intense self-preoccupation that we have and anyone who lives in the united states right now must yeah. have with our with the, the crisis here but the, the surprise is not really china because they kind of i think broadly speaking i i was never in the chernobyl moment camp i think that's a liberal that's a that's a real sign of our kind of failure to grasp the 21st century the idea that somehow Xi's regime will be felled by some event like this is just, I think, delusional. Yeah. 
What's really been surprising is how Europe's pulled itself together. It hasn't in any way solved the problems, I don't think. It isn't out of the woods, but it's managed at least to salvage some po positive political energy out of what looked like a classic replay of 2010, and we've yeah. not gone there. And then, you know, it, the crisis has just exposed profound, so many layer upon layer of dimensions of the American crisis that are, that are really remarkable. And... And then the third, and, and that has to be juxtaposed to the third story which I've been tracking, and which is the reason why I became, I think, I mean, literally sucked in by journalistic demand into a day to day, hour by hour conversation about what was going on in March from the 9th of March is the convulsions in the global financial system that were unleashed by this event and the frantic efforts by central bankers around the world to stitch together a safety net to, to prevent the public health crisis and the economic crisis being compounded by a financial heart attack, which really looked as though it was going to happen in March. And, and some of the tools that they used, in fact, all of the key tools that they used were, were anticipated by the measures that they adopted in 2008, um, notably the swap line system to funnel dollars around the global central banking system, but also the absolutely massive asset purchases that pumped dollar liquidity into the system. Um, and as we've dug deeper and deeper into what happened in the second and third week of March, it's, it's, it's become clear that there was an extra dimension of crisis in the sovereign debt market, which was much more severe than I think we saw in 2008. But that realization has sort of dawned on us slowly. But that is, as it were, the, where the discussion is going now or has been going for, for recent months. So those are the three, yeah. as it were, mm -hmm. lines of continuity that, that have been very preoccupying. Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to ask you more about Europe. But I mean, I think... I want, to, I want to follow up your last point first, which is, you know, I feel like people f f feel such a schizophrenic divide between what they fear might be happening with the economy and kind of like where the markets are at, the, especially, you know, the last month or so. Mm. So how have you been kind of making sense of that? Do you think the central bank responses earlier were just adequate to prop up the financial system for the time being or do you you know i mean I, I constantly see people on twitter and elsewhere you know saying like this is kind of like fantasy la la land when they look at the stock market at this point um i mean <laughs> i'm by no means like an equities market yeah you know, in all of these respects in some but i'm really a kind of a meta observer i'm not really a mm -hmm. central bank watcher either yeah um and i i particularly haven't really ever been a follower of equity markets, but more so as a result of this crisis than ever before. Um, but yeah, so let's just sort of, so it is crucial what the central banks did in March, because the crisis that we were seeing there went to the heart of the entire system. So mm -hmm. because the equity markets were as disrupted as they were, the funds, the asset management funds of various types and hedge funds that were coming under pressure couldn't sell equities, even if equities were their business because the losses would have just been too huge. So the things they were liquidating were sovereign debt. And, and when they did that on the scale that they did, it began to destabilize really the foundational structure of the, of the entire pyramid of financial assets. Because if you have a pyramid of financial assets, then equities are kind of the frothy bit. Right. The, the solid foundation is the US Treasury market between 17 and $20 trillion, depending on how you count it. It ought to be like, as near to cash liquid as anything in the world. And from the 9th of March, it stopped being so. <laughs> and that really was as though like gravity had been briefly suspended or the foundations of the building had suddenly come loose. And it doesn't, they don't have to shake very far or come very loose for it to basically disorientate the entire system. So without that, we wouldn't, we would be in a very different reality. Having mm -hmm. done that, I don't think there's any doubt at all that there's a broad understanding in equity markets that the Fed is wholly committed to holding interest rates at a very low level and minimizing the risk of cascading and massive bankruptcies. But mm -hmm. there have been, of course, plenty of bankruptcies where, you know, historic highs in terms of bankruptcy rates. I think we're going to see more as the year goes on, yeah. which I think is also why if you look at the stock market, it's in fact totally you know it's split in three parts there are bits which have recovered there are bits which are still well down on their free march levels and then there's the tech sector and the, yeah, the tech right. sector is just blown up and and that doesn't seem to me an altogether unrealistic assessment of 
you know, COVID is going to do one thing, it's clearly going to amplify inequality and it's going to do that at all different levels and it's also yeah. doing it within the corporate world. So some sectors have demonstrated that they're completely indispensable, at least in, you know, under the current construction, yeah. given prevailing conditions, we all need Amazon, quote unquote. Right. It's difficult to live without it. Um, and so unsurprisingly, you know, it has emerged as, you know, quasi-utility-like. So one p thing people used to have been saying is that the, the tech gamble is really a it's it's actually a hedge it's actually it's not speculative it's a run to a kind of safety because that's the one right. bit of the economy which looks as though you know the people on robin yeah, hood yeah. have been playing around with hertz stock which is in chapter 11 that's a different story i think yeah but they're not driving the big bulk in the market what looks like this run up is driven by a very small group of shares so mm -hmm. um i think you can see it as essentially rational um in light of the three things, in other words, the basic stabilization, then the then their Fed put promise that things are not going to go really south south, and then thirdly, this kind of sexual gamble that there's bits which will sink and there's bits that will swim, uh, and some will do even better than that. Um, yeah, and it's funny that on the you know on the bankruptcy front, so many of the firms that have been going under are like retail firms and stuff yeah. that weren't doing well for a long anyway. time anyway, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is so pushing people over the edge, basically. Right. Uh, um, I think it's going to be more interesting to see like the airlines and yeah. these sorts of entities where, um, and they're big employers, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a bit more uh, about the EU. So, I mean, I think that yeah, I've, I've seen you write that the, you know, the EU really has done some, you know, historically um, surprising and big things um, since March, including taking on a debt of its own and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, where do you think it's placed for, I mean, I, I've also seen you talk about, you know, that when it came to the 2008 financial crisis, in a lot of ways, like serious reconstruction didn't start until 2010 or something like that when it came to developing economies. So how do you think the kind of EU is placed right now in terms of polit the politics of the economy for you know, the next year or two? Much better than we, we people expected. Um, much better than seemed likely all the way through to the end of April. I mean, it's important to remember that up to the end of April, really, Merkel was resisting any efforts by the French to enroll her in their joint projects. And um, it really did look like a replay of sort of the politics of 2010 through the politics of the period since 27, the entire period since Macron was elected, because the French, after all, have been asking for cooperation from Germany really from the get-go um, and haven't had it. Um, and for that to have flipped is, is quite remarkable. But I think, um, and so you're right that the, the deal is impressive, but the deal was done essentially through a creative reinterpretation of the situation, right? So the decision was to say, these are not the old problems. These are not therefore problems of moral hazard. The Italians can't be held accountable for this type of, this type of risk. And so therefore, we can set all of those old arguments aside and move forward to a new set of solutions, which are indeed quite creative. You could argue about whether they're large enough, but there's yeah. no doubt at all that they are large and they're new and novel, and it required a huge amount of political leverage to, to get Europe to where it's gotten to. Um, but that also means that the old problems were not resolved. So, and the vast majority of the stimulus effort is still going to be, have to be done through national budgets. And so the Italian debt is still going to be rising to 150% of GDP or more by next year. Right. And there is an answer for that, um, but it's one that Europe has found incredibly difficult to, to deal with, which is the warehouse it on the balance sheet of the central bank. Um, which has effects, it, you know, it creates a bunch of extra reserve deposits held by the banks that sell their Italian debts to the ECB. So this isn't, it isn't a neutral thing to do, but it's a, it's a way of containing the problem, holding interest rates low and therefore holding us in what uh, Pisani, Ferry and Blanchard have called like the good equilibrium. You know, they have this model of two equilibria for Europe. And one is self-sustainingly good and one is, self one is a vicious circle of downwards to unsustainability. And, um, you can, by means of central bank intervention, ensure that we stay in a good equilibrium, which is more like Japan's situation, um, except as a lower level of debt. 
And the only, the only other option is to actually devise a mechanism to, I mean, this is setting aside, you know, what I take to be fantastical suggestions of a debt cut or, you know, just writing off all the debt on the ECB's balance sheet. I don't think they're ever going to do that, but they could park the debt there and it wouldn't, you know, because essentially mm -hmm. I agree with the MMT people. It's not like, it's not a problem. Um, right. and especially when it's warehoused on the central bank, that's as close to it being the case that we owe the money to ourselves as right. you can create. Cause it's, it's, it's as it, it has the distributional profile of the tax base, basically, mm -hmm. ultimately, um, for better or worse. Um, but if you're not going to do any of those things, the only other option is to find a way of growing Italian GDP. Like, and that, that would change the ratio in a positive direction. And, and Europe hasn't found that formula. And it's not obvious that that formula exists for aging, right. moderately well-educated and not outstandingly well-educated advanced economy societies. That there may not be a formula that allows you to rapidly accelerate Italy's growth to 4% per annum. It's right. nominal. It doesn't have to be real. It could just be nominal. But getting inflation of 4% is also practically impossible. So... <laughs> I think those are the those will be the caveats that the 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 politics are way better than we would have expected, but this certainly isn't the fix. And so, to that extent, one should expect more trouble further down the line. Right? That we mm -hmm. since we haven't really broken the frame, um, either we need to do more and more and more of the type we've already done, and the Dutch have already signaled that they have a limited degree of patience for that. Right. Or you know we have to come up with one of these solutions which we don't have so my judgment about it is it's strictly relative it's you know it's, a, mm -hmm. it's relative in two senses relative to the situation in the u.s but also to relative where we thought europe was heading in april because it's still the case that the public health disaster in europe in april is far worse than that in the u.s right so right for all of our sort of lacer self-lacerating criticism of u.s covid response in the end italy france spain the uk it's like four New Yorks, um, right. which is pretty awful. I mean, a significant theme in, in Crash is the role that austerity and, and fear of government debt played in mm -hmm. constraining um, policy action. Do, I mean, do you think that so far, maybe it hasn't played, though, as you, a role, much of a role, uh, though, as you say, people are already kind of flagging an unwillingness, both in the States and in Europe, to go much further. So. Do you foresee that continuing to play a role um, in the next year or two, just fear of debt and austerity? Um, yes, I do. I think, I think it'll take some, it'll take some, it'll take some real political work to avoid a return to that kind of politics. Um, um, I think, um, I think the one major obstacle, I think the norm, what one should expect is a return to that kind of politics. I think, um, and you see it already and the Germans, you know, Biden has, has sort of announced that at the German central bank, all of what they've done so far is temporary. And, and given their worldview and their understanding of how debt functions, that's just, that's exactly what you would expect. Um, but um, I think the question is going to be whether or not the realities of the debt situation, if one can be, you know, as sort of positivist as that, yeah. um, won't force a change in a rethink. Um, because um, it's just not easy to see how you construct a plausible world in which Italy, through austerity, through spending cuts and tax increases, gets itself from 150% to 125%. Yeah. Now, this hasn't prevented the EU from constructing those kind of fantasy worlds for Greece, for instance. Um, Varoufakis reminded us a few months ago now of the fact that in the, I think in May or in June, you know, a EU committee solemnly sat down and, are, you know, co committed Greece to returning to its debt management program, which it has agreed with what's left of the Troika, which requires it to return to major primary services next year. So, 
you know, one shouldn't underestimate the capacity to conjure up essentially unreal um, worlds. Yeah. But, um, but I don't think they're going to be able to make that work with Italy. So that's my, that's kind of the thing that I think may have changed. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, just to be clear uh, for myself, you're saying that the reality, the, it, the Italy problem might be so big that they have to come up with a different way of looking at things like, cause that's just not going to go away. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, you can, you know, the thing about austerity politics is the, is that if fully implemented, it will be absolutely ruinous. So, and yet it's a sort of almost compulsive fantasy. This is something yeah. I do agree with like the MMT people on. There is right. a mythological quality to their kind of politics. I mean, it's, 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 and, and yet if fully implemented under the, uh, under many circumstances, it's disastrous in its real effects and would be self-refuting if it was ever allowed to actually be fully implemented in practice without its opponents or some other countervailing force pushing back against it. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah. you know, so the ECB enables fiscal austerity in the way in which a spouse enables their spouse's alcoholism. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> it's that kind of, you know, and what do you do? You're going to leave the person and, you know, divorce them and then watch them spiral into onto Skid Row, or do you right. stay with them and, work through it but do you in the process basically enable their dysfunctional behavior and that's essentially the relationship which the central banks have been performing performed in relation to to um to austerity after 2010. so to extend this rather ugly analogy italy as though you present the alcoholic with a case of whiskey yeah as you say no, i'm not gonna this isn't a rehab question it's just that if you drink this you'll be dead. Yeah. But that's the, like, how <laughs> bad is your, how bad is your delusion? Right. right. You know, like it's, I know, no doubt the austerity people can tell themselves that, but it just, if they did attempt to do it, it they die. I mean, Italy is, you know, as the cliche goes, it's too big to fail. It's too big to bail. So if Christ is Italy is allowed to really spiral into, which is why it never has been. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so then you, as it were, engaged in this game of mirrors, really, where, as it were, the austere, the Merkel and whoever governs Germany pretends to do enough to satisfy her right wing or their right wing. Right. Um, whilst the ECB frantically bails and everyone hopes that, you know, a bunch of people, ideologues don't bring a case before the German Supreme Court. And even when they do and the German Supreme Court rules that something can be cited here, you all just simply say, oh, no, move along. It's nothing to see here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which is how they've chosen to handle it this year. Uh, so anyway, that that I think for me is the is the the way in which reality figures here in this in this argument is that to a degree austerity is a delusional politics sustained by the countervailing forces of reality <laughs> that simply says. And America is such a transparent example of this, right? Because yeah, it, you know, because it it's clear that the interests of business are not actually strongly aligned with fiscal balance no. at all. It's, it's just not, it's just not clear in what way they would be. Well, um, Republicans talk about it and they get in power and it goes and away as even a thought. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then the Democrat, you know, a group of Democrats come in who convince themselves it's their job to sort of right the ship. And so yeah. they slow things down again. I mean, it's, um, it's a very, it's a very weird gray zone kind of politics. I want to talk to you more about growth. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think we live in this moment of incredible hype around technological potential and, you know, so-called tech companies. Um, and yet, as you know, the last few decades have been marked by relatively slow growth in many advanced countries and companies that were hailed as being revolutionary, like whether Uber or WeWork or Spotify are turning out to be unprofitable. And, you know, it's unclear how long this can kind of continue. So, well, I think that there was this hope for a long time that, you know, going back to the, you know, post-World War II period, maybe even before, that innovation in our economy would uh, generate the growth to kind of like solve many problems, if not all problems. Um, yet, you know, here we are in the middle of this deep recession. Um, and even before the recession, um, 
we have this kind of slow growth going on. So, you know, if we're going to have our uh, hope for the future of the economy, um, well, here we are in this, like, again, this really deep crisis. Um, you know, where should we place that hope if it's not in innovation? How do, how do economies, whether it's the U.S. or Italy, or they don't have growth as a, as a near-term solution? Yeah, I, I mean, this is, as you know, I mean, it's not, it's not an area that I've actually spent a lot of time, you know, working on. None of my books really have growth at the heart mm -hmm. of, their, of their stories. They're much more event-orientated, um, or politically driven in the cases of wages of destruction. Um, and obviously I'm inclined to take a somewhat relativistic view on the notion of the economy. I don't mean radically relativist, I just, it's not difficult for me to conceive of a world in which we re rethink what the economy is or reprioritize, you know, growth, which is after all a highly artificial construct. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, all sorts of things. I don't need to tell you, you know, like most of the good things in life are artificial constructs. So that's not, that right. by yeah, the, yeah, in yeah. and of itself is not, you know, it's like yeah. bridges are great. I love bridges. They, um, um, so, and you're much more of a, you know, student of technology than I am. Um, but the evidence using our conventional measures of a slowdown in productivity growth is pretty hard to deny. And the evidence also of um, um, the increasing costs of innovation is pretty hard to deny, right? You know, the bill how, how, how many yeah. billions it takes to produce a patentable molecule is right. con continuously growing. To obtain the miracles of Moore's law, we, we spend more and more money to obtain that. So it seems as though there's diminishing returns to investment in our existing conventional, in our existing technological paradigm. But it's also undeniably true, I think, broadly speaking, that, um, you know, that, that most of those macro indicators also suggest that we're just not trying as hard as we used to, in the sense that overall spending, especially government-led spending, so a relatively um, um, blue sky, open-ended, fundamental type research has actually mm -hmm. dropped down the priority scale dramatically. Yeah. Um, in areas where we have spent heavily, like biotech, you know, the cost of sequencing the genome, like has, has you know, exhibits all of the good stuff that we love so much. You know, has it immediately transformed medicine? No, but do we know a vastly greater amount about molecular biology? Yes, obviously, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a, there's a sense to me in which part of the reason, you know, I'm not convinced that, as it were, growth is dead, but I, it's pretty obvious, I think, that the current political economy is not ideally set up to foster and produce it. Now, if we were really interested in growth, we would presumably be following something more like the 50s formula. In other words, yeah. inclusive, broad-based, general, high-quality education for everyone, um, upskilling the workforce at all levels, you know, blue-collar, white-collar, the whole works. We would actually be talking about enabling women to participate in the workforce efficiently through massive subsidized childcare, and we would be spending hugely on America's, you know, we're just talking about America's on the public universities, which were always the big drivers of this. And yeah. we would be lavishing money on CUNY and SUNY and all of the kind of outfits that we know generate upward mobility in the society. And since we are not, and are very systematically not doing any of that, it's difficult for me to simply say, well, the game's up for growth. It's just right. that we have a, you know, I mean, if we were, if we were intending to slow our growth down and produce highly unequal slow growth, we'd pretty much be doing exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas the Chinas of this world um, are, are following a different model. Um, theirs isn't our model of the 50s either, but it's their version. And in quantitative terms, it's amazing in its scale. And who yeah. knows what happens when you equip as many minds as they're equipping with STEM PhDs. God knows what comes out when you do that. We don't know yet. They've only been doing it for 10 years. It's too early to tell. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know the scale of connectivity and so on. So I'm kind of like... Even before yeah. we get to the environment and everything else, um, and this is, I, I admit, obviously a very kind of, I don't think David Edgerton would approve. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a rather avant-gardist kind of view, but I am tempted by the idea that, like I say, we're just not trying as hard as we used to. And we're certainly not trying in the right ways. Um, 
And if we did spend some of our enormous affluence in those kind of ways, it's difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of yeah. tempted by the idea we'd probably actually get some amazing things out of it that might mm -hmm. be envelope changing such that, you know, the returns to research were not as diminishing as they currently are. Um, but this is obviously a big science fantasy and I can't, yeah. it's, it's well, hypothetical I want, <laughs> and I can't easily yeah. back it up with anything. Yeah. Right? Well, I want to ask you to do that a little bit more actually, but um, uh, hold on, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, why don't we just, I mean, if you, this might be exactly the kind of question you don't want to answer, but if, you know, you had a kind of Adam II's wish list of like pandemic policies you'd like to see passed for the economy. I and mean, let's focus mostly on Europe, but we can talk about the states first. Uh, what would they be? Well, I mean, I think I think they need to do what we all need to go on doing what we were doing, and the real risk is that we stop doing it far too soon, right? I mean, I'm totally with the MMT people again. It's just like blow the budget deficits out. The 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 stimulus packages that were you know agreed in March and April at the national level were historic in scale, and we need to keep on doing that. Um, you know, to global level, we need to be thinking really hard about what we might be able to do by way of the IMF. You know, mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of avenues were shut down in April as a result of the resistance of the Trump administration. Um, so we need to continue support basically either for work, uh, short time working until the problem disappears or supplements to unemployment benefit because everything else is a disaster, I think. In the, uh, you, you need to, and this is analogous between Europe and the United States, you need to ensure that the fiscal policy is reaching the bits which are most stressed. So um, you need to ensure the resources are getting down to the frontline communities in, say, southern Europe, which were hit worse. And likewise, in the US, we need to ensure that the largesse that's dispersed in Washington also gets to the states and to local government and to cities, which are you know, facing an absolutely devastating crunch. Yeah. Um, and without that, we're going to have massive counterbathing, you know, contractions. Um, and then, frankly, I just don't understand why spending on vaccine research and, and even more remarkably on various types of treatment is denominated in like single and double digit billions. <laughs> when, yeah. like, when we talk about green policy, uh, you know, even in America, they talk about trillions without even flinching. Yeah. The IEA in the middle of this crisis launched a huge green transition global energy program that was denominated, I think, at three or four billion, three or four trillion. Um, that's the kind of scale that we need to be talking in terms of. And, and there's, I'm, I still, I've not really, I mean, the economist had a, I mean, a whole bunch of people suddenly said it simultaneously. It's like, hang on, I feel like I'm in the wrong, in a different world here. Like if you come out of central banking, if you come out of green energy dis debates, you're two orders of magnitude larger in terms of the policy boost that you're talking about to when you're in the vaccine space. You know, to be spending yeah. 40 billion on vaccines is unprecedented. I want them to spend 4 trillion. Like, yeah. find me the bloody scientists. <laughs> like, don't yeah. they understand? <laughs> like, you know, this isn't a billion dollar thing we're talking about here. You know, New York, New York City's deficit is 6 billion. Like, right. there's not a <laughs> member of the G20 whose stimulus program in response to COVID wouldn't have paid for the entire global vaccine effort. Yeah. South Africa's stimulus program was large enough to pay for the global vaccine effort. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, and there may be bottlenecks. And again, you, you know, people who are in the like STS world will have a clearer idea. There are clearly material bottlenecks to our ability to actually absorb this kind of money. Yeah. But hell, we need to talk about changing them. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, because... Is this isn't good enough. We can't be running out of pipettes and rubber gloves yeah. and all this kind of shit. Like, this is crazy. Um, mm. So, I mean, I think those are the proactive big, but this is, you know, I mean, a lot of this is, all of this is, I think, fairly, it is very obvious, really. We need a gen, generously dimension at one level, wholly unspecific large scale support for households, above all, because this yeah. is a crisis of households. And small businesses, if we can find some mechanism for getting resources down to them, and then and then um, quite targeted kind of industrial policy style um, spending on on the areas that, that allow us to address the Anthropocene. And we don't, you know, we, yeah. we have a, we have a pretty general idea of what those are, but but, but it's going to involve redundancy and it's going to involve waste because 
yeah because the nature of this beast is we don't know but if in the meantime we're spending you know if we're wasting money paying people to develop vaccines that don't work out by the standards of the things that we waste money on mm -hmm. <laughs> you know those are good jobs that's an interesting you know if you if you were part of the team that failed to develop the winning vaccine you weren't wasting your life yeah. <laughs> like, um so you know, those are well-paid jobs in interesting professions in doing important things. Like that's exactly the, you know, so. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of, sorry. That's yeah, no, that's issue. great. I mean, I was going to ask you a bit more about the Anthropocene actually. So, I, I mean, your work has increasingly been focusing on the economics of climate change, climate policy. Is that, are you writing a new, uh, is that your next project or? Well, that was. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I've been through a, like a, two phases of disorientation. So I did, I started the work the earth writing a, a, a history, histor historical political economy of the Anthropocene, mm -hmm. um, stimulated by the Green New Deal debate and capital scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, all the familiar stuff you'll be amply familiar with. Then was side of side swiped by COVID, got sucked into it by way of um, really the financial crisis in March and the extent to which crashed was kind of wrapping around on me as a narrative that people were using to orientate themselves. But also more fundamentally in the sense that my climate book was premised, as I think the common sense went, on the fact that the economy was the dominant obstacle to moving right. on things like climate. And so what we needed to understand was what exactly those constraints were, only then to discover that faced with a rather different type of shock, but one that was broadly speaking still derivable, at least if you believe the emerging infectious diseases paradigm from anthropocenic type of logics, we were perfectly willing to stop the entire economy. In fact, it suddenly became a matter of common sense to do so. And you had to argue quite hard to say, well, maybe you know, this isn't worth doing. Um, can, can you spin out this so that, emerging? That, like, that, that flipped me around, really. That yeah. The kind of, um, and then it turns out, so I thought I was writing like a, you know, instant penguin special type book literally what i contracted to do with penguin and then they discovered that they couldn't actually produce the book because their right. own production processes have been so disrupted and so now it's going to come out like next fall and it's going to be some <laughs> sort of retrospective on 2020 the year that changed oh wow you know world like so it so i've gone through this is i'm on my third vision of the book that i'm trying to write this year yeah. um and each time it shifts anyway um yeah can you spell out the emerging what is the, the emerging disease Infe par infectious yeah. diseases yeah. paradigm yeah it's it's absolutely fascinating so and i you know i had maybe an inkling of this like most people i think but not really a clear historical sense of the co-evolution of historical epidemiology it's actually a field and um, climate science. Um, but broadly speaking, they really do. So from the 50s, late 50s, early 60s onwards, you have an, at first fringe group of epidemiologists talking about the systemic disruption to the global viral environment, disease environment as a result of modernity. And it, just like with climate science, it starts you know, really from a kind of left field position. Um, by the 70s, some of those epidemiologists are becoming very powerful voices in the ecological movement of the time. So, um, you know, Act Global, Think Local is in fact a slogan coined by epidemiologists huh. um, because epidemics are like that. That's the nature yeah. of epidemics. And then in the 19... And then in the 1980s, what you've seen is a full-blown um, backlash against what's called the theories of epidemiological transition, which were a bit like the theories of demographic transition, which suggested, as it were, that humanity was going to move away to away from infectious disease as a major killer collectively towards diseases of affluence and old age as the major killers, which is true, of course, in the advanced economies until AIDS mm -hmm. came along, but it isn't true of the developing world. <laughs> and the combination really, and the chronological alignment is spectacular. So 1989 is obviously the end of the Cold War. It's the first date of the major intergovernmental climate conference is 1989. But it's also the date of the major conference at Rockefeller in 
uh, Manhattan that launched the emerging infectious diseases paradigm, so called, amongst epidemiologists, looking at AIDS and Ebola as harbingers of a new generation of extremely dangerous infectious diseases that were not the cholera, yellow fever, plague model of infectious disease that came out of the 19th century um, and that were systematically generated by various types of zoonotic and other um, mutation process that were systematically generated by modernity. So um, land use, human uh, intensive agriculture, and then of course the vectors are all amplified by global travel. Mm -hmm. um, and so within epidemiology at the same time as within climate science and environmental science generally, you see the emergence of this really very profound critique of modernity in terms of uh, epidemiological risk. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, and, and of course, then you can see all sorts of convergent strands because as, 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 the, as the climate heats up, the, the environmental background for, for viral mutation um, changes and becomes more favorable. There's a whole bunch of diseases that they think may sweep out of the tropics as a result of climate change. Um, yeah. So it's a very interesting convergence that I have to say, I might have been aware of through the mechanism of this will get worse because there's climate change, but I had not thought more fundamentally about the incredibly close intertwining between mm. these modes of thinking about the Anthropocene. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, now, I mean, once you, once you map out the history and once you understand even the outlines of that story, it seems to me incredibly compelling, but also very fascinating to think about the differences. So I've used the military analogy to compare them. You know, the, the, the climate change model seems much more like a kind of attritional battle. Um, it's structural, it's about changing the economics, changing the economy, um, whereas the, whereas the, you know, if, the, if the, the virus has a military analogy, it's something closer to Blitzkrieg. It's very fast moving. If you don't react immediately, you lose. Your losses rise right. exponentially. Yeah. The more slowly you respond, you know, mm -hmm. it's really, and everything happens on a timeline, not of 12 years, but of 12 days. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's really kind of quantum leap. It requires, it doesn't necessarily require massive adjustments to the society, but it requires very high levels of vigilance. It requires hugely rapid, you know, response, um, attention to minute detail rather than the big picture um it's really a very different mindset from the problem of though they are both i think i'm convinced i mean of course these are all gambles on a particular none of this is this is fully symmetric latourian i yeah. only i only know this because some scientist has told me so right you know or not even a scientist but some popularized version of some scientific argument suggests that this is the case so mm -hmm. um but if it is a reasonable construction then it then it suggests two very different types of anthropocenic dynamic um, we can imagine, uh, you know, the nations using the pandemic. I've seen a lot of left leaning people in the States primarily, but elsewhere too, hoping that nations will use the pandemic to uh, create meaningful climate policy, uh, whether it's Green New Deal stuff mm. or, you know, building up renewables and building weatherization and stuff like that. I mean, what do you think is the likely kind of outcome of the pandemic for climate policy for the next couple of years? Do you think it's, because I can also see it going totally the other way, that it just gets buried as a, an issue, you know, that it's just like pushed aside because of where we're at. I think, I think that is indeed, I mean, it's an open question. It's all to be played for. It will depend on politics. Um, in Europe, which is the case which I, you know, where I think you can see this played out most transparently, it has not had the displacement effect that you would anticipate. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like, I hate to say this, but like they're kind of reasonable people just like you and me. So they read the same <laughs> newspapers and they're perfectly capable of deciding, you know what, this is an anthropocentric shock. Like, yeah. oh, it's like that other anthropocentric shock. Oh fuck, the anthropocene is more complicated <laughs> than we thought. Should we completely lose attention to climate? No, evidently not. That would be really stupid, wouldn't it? Let's not right. do that. Let's do the thing that we were planning to do anyway. Hey, there's a load of unemployed people. We need to spend some money. Green policies make excuses for investment. Let's do that. Like, you don't have to be a radical. You just have to be Ursula von der Leyen. You just have to be Angela Merkel. You just have to be like a mainstream European conservative. This isn't difficult. Like, 
like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, is it good for business? Yeah, it's totally good for business. Are people going to have profits? Yes. Can we become, you know, is this an industrial policy where we can excuse, you know, all sorts of neoliberal crimes? Yes, absolutely. Let's do that then. Like, <laughs> this isn't, this really isn't, like, it's not that difficult. Has RWE, the big German electricity generator, hedged in carbon prices forever? Yes. So they're not going to get hurt. No. So let's do it then, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Like, it's really not, it's not that difficult. Um, yeah. You know, like, does, does anyone here want to make a big bet on fossil fuels anytime soon? No, no, not thank you very much. I don't really think I do. <laughs> but let's leave that to somebody else. Like, like it's, it's, um, you, it's incredibly easy to build a consensus around this. Like, yeah. and, and it's really not at all difficult to convince people that, that, yeah, this is a natural shock and it's produced, broadly speaking, by our unhealthy lifestyle. And so, therefore, this is a wake-up call. And was this a pain in the neck? Yes, it really was. Do we want to live like this in future? No. Should we do something about it? Yes. I mean, like, none of that's difficult. And I, I, that's broadly speaking, you know, the Tories can say this. Yeah. You know, the closest European analogue, probably, to Trumpism. And they're perfectly capable of joining up these dots. This isn't... And it's only they, difficult in the States. It, it, it's only difficult for a certain part of the GOP. It's not difficult yeah. in general in the States. They, yeah. Even like Duke Energy and people like that have got <laughs> the message. No, I mean, seriously, they yeah. can do the math. They look at it. Yeah. Texas can do renewable energy just as well as it can do oil and gas. Like, like yeah. it's, it's, it's made for it. Like, how could you not generate sun and wind power there? Like, it's crazy. So, no, I mean, I think it takes a certain sort of, you know, sure, are there going to be losses? Yes, but you book those like Shell and, and, um, and BP have done over the, you, you, this is a good day for trash. You take the trash out. Yeah. You, you book, you know, I think Shell book 15. The, you know, they're, building, they're building huge write downs to their fossil fuel assets. And what's remarkable is that Exxon hasn't made a single move and Exxon got dumped out of the, you know, I think it's quite, a, it's remarkable to me that Exxon's expulsion from the, you know, the Dow Industrial Index hasn't received more attention. And that mm -hmm. energy now is what, two and a half percent of the S&P 500? Yeah. Like, this is rapidly losing its grip on anyone's imagination. Um, yeah. And um, it's not going to be long before people are just going to be saying, no, I don't, you know, everyone is going to be saying, I really don't want my pension money invested in those companies. I don't know what their future is. And when, you know, and yeah. if they don't have an alternative to oil, it will go away. Now, I mean, are there still massive obstacles to overcome? Yes. But I don't, so, so I think if you are bunkered in, committed to a denialist position, nothing about this is going to change your view. Yeah, um, no, totally. But I do think that's an increasingly minoritarian and frankly rather puzzling position. But that doesn't mean that it's not strong in the GOP and it's not strong in Brazil and Russia, Saudi. The, you know, there is a coalition and it showed its face at Madrid at COP25 last year. And we started this year in a panic because we thought, where's the coalition that's really going to overcome that wall of resistance? Um, yeah. And I still think that's a huge issue. And China, I think, is really like swing variable here yeah. because the yeah. Chinese could be... So they are the whole question, like, unless the Chinese go, America is now obviously far less significant than China in the overall story. Um, and they, they appear, there are certainly big parts of the Chinese bureaucracy which fully understand the problem. Um, but it's unclear, I think, whether the escalation of tension with the West doesn't, as it were, hand the game to the fossil fuel lobby in China. Um, and I said to that excellent reporter from New York magazine, like, um, you know, they have politics too. So we shouldn't just assume that they're running the numbers and signing yeah, the basis. No, I like your point about that. They, yeah. yeah. They, they, we have to, if we want China to be a cooperative partner, then we need to create an environment in which the people who are making that case there have some leverage and can actually show, you know, benefits from it. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise the, otherwise the Coleys are going to win out there. So no, I don't, I think, I think, you know, I'm not naive enough to say that, you know, that rapidly, you know, that, you know, because we were able to do this stopping the economy for COVID, well, then it's easy to see what we should do for the climate. I mean, I take rather the reverse position, which is that when the Extinction Rebellion said we should stop flying, everyone said, no, we're not going to do that. You know, that will be a catastrophe and you're crazy. Mm -hmm. well, we may have been wrong about them being crazy, but we weren't wrong about it being a catastrophe. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is an absolute disaster, <laughs> and we yeah. were not prepared for it. 
and millions of people are going to lose their jobs. And yeah. this is not a just transition. And yeah. without a just transition, the politics of this are terrible. So, yeah. you know, there needs to be a, the, the, the stakes have just gone up because we need to do what we've done this year in terms of reductions in CO2 emissions every year for the next 15. Right? Yeah. And, and that just gives you a measure of how, how, how difficult it will be. So I think the serious people are saying, you know, no, double down. But oh my god! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh shit! Right. <laughs> I'm very conscious of your time, but I have a couple of quick questions about maintenance that I want to ask you. Yeah, Is, yeah. Do you have time for that? No, of course. So, no, I'd love to. Um, you know, for a long time, I think popular discourse seemed to hold that like crumbling infrastructure and deferred public maintenance was a distinctly American problem. Mm. Um, whether you know it was like The Economist or just American newspapers. And now whether it's, you know, bridge collapses in Italy or like failing canals in Amsterdam, I think that there's, that argument's harder to make. And I think there's a kind of recognition that the problem's much larger. So I guess, you know, what, do you think there's a role for infrastructure policy? I mean, it sounds like with the Green New Deal stuff, sorry, not to use that term, uh, the green vision you were just spelling out, I can see it playing a role in that. But I mean, in Europe, for instance, do you think there's a role uh, for infrastructure policy and as a response to the pandemic? Well, there absolutely is, and the place where that logic is most acute is Germany, uh, ironically. I mean, Italy, you would expect, given the track record of austerity that's been forced on them all the way back to the early 90s, I mean, um, it's not surprising that Italy's infrastructure is crumbling. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to go very far outside the super affluent north of Italy. If you go to, you know, the south, it's... It's a, it's a, you know, not impoverished country, but it's a country which is not affluent. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I agree. Um, but Germany is really the, the locus classicus for this, this conversation in Europe because the Germans have had negative net public expenditure and the net is the crucial bit because that's where your, you know, interest in, you know, insofar as macroeconomists respond to your interest in maintenance and they do it's in the difference between gross and net and mm -hmm. gross and net gdp are very different <laughs> it's, a, it's actually huge once you actually look at the underlying numbers because normally we're interested in the time series so once you've made the adjustment you you get you, you just ignore it but in fact if you the the scale of the adjustment from 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 gross to net gdp from from net gdp to nnp is remarkable um and in the German case, there's been negative net investment in the public sector for many years. And there is a, there is a discussion in Germany very analogous to the, the American one um, about the fraying of infrastructure, of bridges in the German case as well. And these are, these are, you know, these are cohort effects. You know, if, you, if you went through a major road building program, as both Germany and the US did in the course of motorization in the, right. it's, it's far later than we would imagine. Like, you know, a lot of it's in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Then half a century on, you are suddenly confronted with the problems of maintaining it. Yeah. I, I actually think if you want to capture the US, the specifics of the US experience, I agree. And I, by the way, some of the data suggests that American public expenditure has been higher than it has been in Germany. Uh, hmm. Public investment has been higher. And this is so difficult to square with the realities of any being anywhere on the kind of extended Rust Belt corridor in the northeast of the United yeah. States. If you go to other bits of the US, it's easier to see. Like if you go to Arizona and you know, mm -hmm. the affluent New South, some of the infrastructure there looks excellent. Yeah. Um, and the weather helps. But, uh, but I think that there's a specific element to the American case, which is more something, a kind of, it's another refinement of your basic idea, I think, which has got something to do with dilapidation. Yeah. So the, the, the spectacular appearance of, that is the right word, dilapidation. Um, yeah. So it's not just a failure to repair, mm -hmm. it's a failure to tidy, to clean, right. to care, right? Yeah. It's, and because the Germans don't repair, but they do care. And then the thing <laughs> breaks because they haven't repaired it, but you wouldn't, uh -huh. you wouldn't expect it to break because it looks clean. Right. Whereas the Americans are more consistent in a sense. They just really don't give a shit. <laughs> they, yeah. They just we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I tweeted this picture of a post office just like one block up from us 
And the, I swear to God, there's not a post office in Germany that looks like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a disgrace. This is a public yeah, building uh, with like the emblems of the United States prominently emblazoned on the front door. And it looks like a derelict building. Yeah. I mean, it's, and there's a logic to that, right? There's a, it's not a, of course, it's a racially mixed neighborhood. This isn't, you know, this is a, yeah. all together, many of the buildings all around also look derelict. Um, but there's a, there's a, there's a specific feature. And so on superficial observation, it's, I think, hard to avoid the conclusion that there's a particular type of dilapidation and dereliction in the US, which doesn't really have an allergy in Europe. Yeah. But on the realities of, as it were, technical functioning, um, the differences are rather, you know, rather less, rather less stark. But I, and I, and I think that in the, this is a non, you know, it sounds sort of trivial, but I actually think it's highly significant with regard to the fate of post-industrial spaces. Um, you know, there, there are, I have a very good friend in Berlin who's a, what's called a landscape architect. I don't uh -huh. know whether this profession exists in the United States as a public landscape, not for people's back gardens. Okay. <laughs> but his commissions consist of sculpting, aesthetically sculpting and environmentally sculpting post-industrial spaces. And he yeah. just does one after another huge multi-million euro projects all over Germany you know, landfill, you know, quarries yeah. turned into beautiful recreation grounds. And you see it in like, you know, the High Line. The High but, Line, yeah. But, but, but no, but like, that's like... That's one, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, know, you, you cannot like, you know, you cannot shut a business in Germany without providing the lands, the architecture. Oh, really? the landscape. No, 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 of course. You're oh, responsible wow. for like the, you can't, uh... you, you can't just walk away and leave it. Right, okay. Right? Yeah. Like, until that's the rats a very different move world. It. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or they like in you know Bridgeport, Connecticut, or wherever they just, yeah. they left the buildings for fifteen years. Then they mm -hmm. had the crack epidemic. God knows what else. And then they just yeah. bulldozed them and turned them into car park, you know, concrete car mat, uh, tarmac. Yeah. I mean, you can't, so that that um, until you get to the point where you don't have to have to these demolition programs, like these huge urban demolition programs, where they use you know just yeah. There's something beyond maintenance that yeah. goes into the zone. Mm -hmm. the, where I think you recapture the specificity of the US and where the analogies to the emerging market world or to the post-communist world are much closer. It's as yeah. though the spirit just absolutely leaves the place. It's like yeah. it's, there's nothing, there's no interest left. Um, yeah. That doesn't happen as much in Europe, even if the maintenance numbers are bad too. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, just on maintenance, I have a final kind of question about, you know, how to think about these issues. So uh, some, several people have brought up to me, um, like in How Capitalism Will End and other texts, Wolfgang Streak has uh, been drawing on thinkers like Schumpeter, but especially Rudolf Goldscheid to mm -hmm. argue that as nations develop, they kind of build out physical infrastructure and human capital programs like health systems that eventually just become unsustainable kind of, not financial debts, but just kind of like infrastructural debts. Um, and that, that, that is a okay, contri contributing factor to, um, you know, slower growth and, you know, eventually like kind of a tilt over of societies. But I just has wanted Strake, to know. Has Strake been using Goldscheid? I've not, I've not yeah. followed his recent, could, could you send me a, a link to yeah, the, those essays? Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, you know, in the neoclassical, in neoclassical growth theory, one of the logics works like that, right? So yeah. there is a point at which capital accumulation reaches the point where the depreciation of existing capital entirely consumes any new flow of investment out of income. And so then you would expect, you know, but then no one predicts catastrophe. You just predict steady state right. at a way higher level of income, happily um, yeah. maintaining a beautiful shiny capital stock so it's not a crisis theory it's a stagnation theory but a stagnation it's a steady state theory it's not right. a stagnation theory. Right. it's a steady state theory yeah as a, a kind of accounting proposition that that makes perfect sense of course the neoclassical growth theory doesn't explain growth it, it is an accounting exercise essentially and so growth is going to be the tfp element which no one really has a good theory for which is what we were talking about early yeah. on yeah. um so 
um, I don't find it easy to immediately, and, and, and all of that is rather oblique to the question of capitalism, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, it's not stagnation, it's not crisis, it is steady state. Does it predict the end of capitalism? Um, I, don't, I just, I'm not sure I kind of see why. Um, it ends up being like government debt is, the, is a big factor. Yeah, well, that's where I'm totally with the MMT people. Right. And, yeah suspect the Strachian brand of continental, I mean, is it neo-Marxism? Not really, but like yeah, yeah, yeah. that brand of leftism is profoundly conservative. They, mm -hmm. they, I'm not sure they understand the logic of debt at all, in fact. Um, I think they're quite good on its politics. I think Strach's notion of the consolidation state is a good description of, I've always thought that was one of his better kind of moves. Um, but it's not analytically forcing, he misunderstands, and he does this repeatedly in his stage theory models, he conflates, um, he concedes too much to the arguments of conservatives that he purportedly is criticizing, but in fact is sort of mirroring from the left side. So he, he seems to accept, for instance, that the inflation of the 70s had to come to an end at some point. Yeah. Um, and that therefore it had to be substituted by debt as the mechanism for sustaining it. And that just doesn't, why? It doesn't, only yeah. if you're Paul Volcker do you think that. It's not obvious that it needed to. Mm -hmm. Paul Volcker thought it did and he put an end to it and that then initiated a new regime in which, as it were, the private accumulation and public accumulation of debt did matter. But there's a, there's a translation of a, of a highly politicized necessity, if you like, into a sort of functional historical logic, which is, is just a non secular and, and, and not compelling. So I, I don't understand why a Japan scenario is at all, pro at, all, at all problematic. It's a capitalist society, yeah. at an incredibly high standard of living, very high functioning in most respects. I don't yeah. what's not to like. I don't, I don't, right. <laughs> I don't get it. I mean, is it the same as Japan in the 50s and 60s? No, but does it have a standard of living about four times higher? Yes. Like, yeah. you know, right. we're, uh, we're confusing rates of growth with levels. Um, yeah. So I don't, I, 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 I will have to actually read these pieces by Strake. He's taken some very unexpected moves recently. That Engels piece in the New Left Review was disappointed me, but I was nevertheless delighted to see like him writing about, about, uh, violence and war um mm -hmm. because that's it's uh hugely uh, you know it's obviously very close to my heart there's a set of questions and um crucially important so that that really took me by surprise so if he's gotten into um yeah it's in the stuff, that book it's, it's and buying time or whatever it's, is it uh, oh no yeah. well i know those very well so then hang on i d it's often in the footnotes it'll be like yeah. in a paragraph or oh, something okay so but you're just like, seeing something that i'm not yeah so, no i mean those Okay, yeah, well, then it's subsumed into that more general yeah. logic, and yeah. I don't buy it as an argument. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, it is also, I mean, after all, depreciation is presumably capital, one of capitalism's great, that's, that's the magic juice. The more you can appreci depreciate, yeah. the better, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. whatever means, crisis, war, or just frankly doing a lot of maintenance. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's right. Oh, that's broken, I need to fix it. <laughs> 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 um, that's... Right. Um, that's gold dust, presumably, for the fixers. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. Just to wrap up, I mean, you know, beyond the U.S. Uh, political, you know, the U.S. election in November, what are the couple things that you'll be kind of tracking most closely over the next six months to a year? Well, the course of the pandemic in uh, the middle-income, low-income countries. I mean, that's the, yeah. the single thing that has kind of got me most... I spent a lot of time, I've never previously dealt at all seriously with Latin America and, and I mean, I've always felt bad about it. And when I was doing Deluge, I did a bunch of reading and then it never made it into the final cut. And um, it was really tangential and crashed that you just can't tell the story of the COVID pandemic without, you know, um, talking seriously about what's happened in Latin America. So that's one yeah. element of it. But, but a, even more pressing, I think, is the is the crisis in India right now. I mean, um, um, 
you know, I mean, they've had a they've had a disaster in economic terms, and the the epidemic there is really gathering pace in an alarming way. Yeah, I know. I've noticed you tweeting about that. So yeah. Um, yeah. that I think is is huge. Yeah. Um, I don't. I you know, we're not out of the woods in Europe yeah. by any means. I'm, I'm I'm not convinced of that. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I, we haven't spoken about it much and I don't want to speak about it much, but I, I do have a passing interest in the Brexit process. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, um, and I hold it at arm's length because it's simply too painful. Um, yeah. but, um, but it could be catastrophic. I mean, we could yeah. be heading towards a hard exit. It could be, it, you know, compounding everything else. It's, it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to, so, and yeah. then you know, there's geopolitical worries everyone has. Like, you know, is Putin going to do something super aggressive over Belarus? And how hard are the Chinese going to push on Hong Kong? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's, this, there's a lot of Tinder out there and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of matches. And uh, um, it's very difficult right now to frame this book I'm supposed to be writing. Yeah, no it's, joke, man. It's just like, it's, it's just it's like, going to be as, it's going to end well, up as big as Crash, right? No, no, I mean, no, 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 this is the other thing. Like, I'm committed to writing a short book. And after all, it's only one year. I mean, Crash yeah. dealt with quite a long time. That's so, right. So, um, but it feels like everyone is totally, you know, this year feels like it's expanded into... Totally. It's 10 years it's, in a year. Yeah. yeah. So, um mm. Yeah. Anyway, those, it's it's not an original list, but I do think focusing on the pandemic outside the advanced economy really is for me like that's it's a real like it's it's a, it's a real test I think of our metal. Like, if, are we capable really of thinking the global in anything yeah. more than an episodic way um, yeah. as a kind of personal discipline as well? Like, can we stick with this story? Yeah. Um, and um, it's not obvious. That, I mean, it's difficult to do. I found it's not really not. It's really not easy. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Adam. This is no, it's great. a pleasure. It's great to talk to you. It's really good to sort of meet you. Yes. We've moved. We never. We've, we've been in and no, out. No, we never hung out. Of, yeah. Exactly. So we've never actually hung out. So it's a real pleasure, and I hope at some point in the future we we do get the chance to do that. Yeah. Me too, man. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much, Adam. Good. Cheers. Stay Bye. safe. Bye.